Welcome to a slightly delayed, but for good reason, edition of the Future Stars uh, forecast featuring my very special guest, Todd Hall of Famer Pletcher, uh, who was just fresh in from uh, traveling back from Saratoga, right? That's right. How are all the horses doing up there? Well, good. We had a productive morning. Unfortunately, yesterday we had a lot of rain, so we kind of had to delay some works overnight, but uh, things went smoothly this morning and uh, Saratoga is right around the corner. Oh, I know. I'm so excited for it, especially, you know, I love the two-year-olds in particular, and that's where the big ones all uh, tend to debut. But my goodness, I, I was just going through and preparing for the show today, and it, it never ceases to amaze me, not just all the great horses that you have in training currently, but so many of them are trained or are by horses that you trained before. I, just the legacy of that. We've talked about that in the past when you've joined me on this show and um, also when we've had you on for ABR. And I mean, I, I don't know. I just look at, it, for example, you got the Belmont Exacta with Mo Donegal and the Philly Nest. And I mean, Mo Donegal, son of Uncle Mo, I, I, what does that mean to you beyond just doing something so impressive as getting that exacta, but doing it with a horse who's the progeny of another of your greats? Yeah, I think it's it's always a little extra rewarding when uh, when that happens. You know, we've been blessed to to have a lot of good stallions come through our barn, and and so you know it, it's exciting. It, it kind of makes it a little more. Uh, exciting just to follow racing in general, you know, when, when we'll watch races and, you know, you'll have a rooting interest, even though you're not in the race because there's a son or daughter of a stallion you trained or, you know, that it makes it exciting. And, you know, I think it, uh, it's something that our team, our team takes a lot of pride in that, that we've, you know, maybe made an impact on the, on the breed itself and, and to, to see, you know, them go on to, to be successful stallions and in some cases successful dams, uh, you know, as a uh, flight line was a, is a son of a, a filly that we trained. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to follow that along and see them do well. I, I just, I, it, when you look at it, do you, do you appreciate pedigree be, be, before you became the Todd father? Did you appreciate pedigree in that regard? And you could see a horse and for example, know that Tessio had his fingerprint on that horse and that line is carried on to see so many of these horses again, that you have come through your barn, that you've touched, that you've, you've educated, that you've gotten into the winter circle and some of the biggest days in racing. When you look at now a five generation pedigree, it's got to feel pretty special to know that going forward in that book, uh, you're part of that legacy. Yeah, it really is. It's, uh, you know, I, I, as a, as a youngster was probably studied pedigrees more then than I, than I have the opportunity to do so now and, uh, was always interested in that, but, but also, you know, for me, a lot of the enjoyment as a, as a, as a young teenager was, was going to the sales with my dad. So, uh, you know, a lot of that, you would look at pedigrees, but also kind of came from the the Wayne Lucas school of, you know, that you got to see that that physical as well. So, you know, when you get both of those, you get the physical and the pedigree, then it, then then you really have something. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting to me just how the game's kind of evolved and it's changed. And and, you know, some a few stallions are obviously breeding a, a lot more mares than they did back then. But uh it's still uh, very interesting to to study pedigrees and which ones work and don't work. And, um, you know, some of the influences for turf and dirt and things like that. I think it's it's a constant learning curve. Oh, yeah. I, and, and just also, I, I that's one of the things that's so great about Uncle Mo, just how versatile he's been. Uh, a champion two-year-old won our Breeders' Cup Juvenile back in 2010. But those horses can run on anything. And here we're going to see Modonical come charging down the stretch uh, to right there, switch that lead, uh, to go on to win the Belmont stakes. And then here comes Nest. What a gutty performance she put in also, by the way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she ran, she ran a terrific race and, and, 
you know, she was, she was still finding a little more at the end. I think, you know, we, she certainly validated that uh, we made the right decision to, to give her a try in there. And if she hadn't stumbled at the start and kind of been bottled up waiting for room for a little bit, I think, uh, I think she was going to make it close. So uh, we're super proud of her performance and uh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun and, you know, watching, watching Mike and his family and, you know, how excited they were, you know, it's uh as he always calls himself, Mike from Queens. This was this was his dream race. Uh, this yeah. was the one that, that he wanted more than, you know, than the Kentucky Derby or anything else. And and to you know have his silks go first and second. I mean, it was a uh, it was exciting to to see his reaction, his family's reaction, and just uh, you know I couldn't be more happy for for him and his team. And it was uh, great for Donegal, who's who yeah. you know supports the game so much. And you know this is. This is what they do. This is their 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 game plan is to try try to purchase classic horses, and you know, and they've done a great job of sort of coming up with a formula that that works to get these horses that'll that'll stay the the Derby or in this case the the Belmont distance. And actually, in Mo Donegal's case, I think you know when you when you look back at it, he he ran a he ran a very good race in the Derby. Unfortunately, you know, I, I do think the one post compromised him that day and. We didn't we didn't get the exact trip we'd set out to um didn't happen that day but in, in the belmont it did in that case we we were we able to work out the exact trip we wanted to i it, it was really i just a, a beautiful performance from both of your trainees um and also i i would say with ness going back to d talking about d wayne lucas and we all know the connection um with you and and uh, the the coach, uh, how he's basically sired a trainer dynasty. Um, and to to be in the Oaks with him with Nest and for Secret Oath to come out on top, I'm sure you, it still felt um, pretty uh, surreal in a way, right? To to he, yeah, I mean, I, I I truly felt like if we couldn't win, you know, that that was that was the greatest outcome possible because. Yeah. You know his, his level of dedication over the number of years, and you know I know when, you know as he's gotten a little older, and and you know the the success hasn't come as easily. He he's never wavered in his enthusiasm for the game and his upbeat personality and his dedication, and you know it, it's really inspiring to watch uh, to watch him do what he does, and and you know I've. I've always said to me, he's, he's the greatest of all time. And some people might surpass some of his records, but no one has had a bigger impact on training racehorses than Wayne Lucas. Well, I, I would certainly say that he was probably um, over the moon with you being inducted into the hall of fame. You're still so young too. Uh, and I would have to say he, I, I would to see him still get on a horse in the mornings. Uh, what is it about these thoroughbreds that keep you guys getting up crack of dawn? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the moments like the Belmont, you know, that that's, that's what you strive for. And, and, uh, you know, that's what keeps you, keeps you motivated and keeps you getting up. And, you know, especially this time of year when there's some exciting two-year-olds in the barn, you, mm -hmm. you got extra, extra things to look forward to. You have so much to look for. I mean, you, you're talking about the two-year-olds, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. In fact, we have uh, uh, Jay talking about always any always dreaming two-year-olds in the barn gearing up for Saratoga. What's next for Colonel Liam? Um, how did Malara come out of her race? I think we're thinking Malatat. Yeah, maybe that's Malatat. <laughs> um, she, if, if it I is Malatat, she... yes. Yeah, if it is Malathot, she she came out of the race great, and uh, you know she's 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 always been a very curious filly, and it's it's been hard to to kind of think about an equipment change with one that that's so successful. But we've we've kind of had in the back of our mind that she's possibly a blinker horse, and John Velasquez uh, commented after the race, and he and I had talked about it several times. He said, "I think it's I think it's finally time to to make that move," and and. He said, "Just just inside the 16th bowl, she saw something and kind of tapped on the brakes, and he felt like it it cost her the win. But oh. you know what what a what a great uh, great filly. She's just been you know such a pleasure to have in the barn. She's got a tremendous personality and just so uh, 
so talented. So uh, we're going to probably Julia explore that with some workers. <laughs> You got the dreaming, you've got the dreaming of Julia connection. Yes, um, yes. So uh, the blinkers, you think are, are going to maybe just put her over the top, hopefully? Yeah. Well, yeah. Just, I mean, we just need that tiny bit more focus, and you know, you could you could see in her in her win off the bench and the double dog there, Keeneland. She she completely just idled when she made the lead that day. So she's she's so smart and so intelligent and so curious that I think she just. You know she needs uh, she needs to to just focus in a little bit more and uh, but uh, yeah she's uh, she's she's been a special one and uh, you know having trained her dam it kind of makes it even more fun. Yeah, absolutely. So we're thinking about the Delaware handicap next for her, with the target being the personal Lenson. Well, I, actually, I think we're going to wait for the shoe V at Saratoga okay. and, and and use that as a as a prep for hopefully the personal Lenson. That's the way we're leaning at the moment. We did nominate her to the Delaware handicap, but I'm kind of leaning towards waiting for Saratoga. Gosh, I mean, two beautiful mares coming down the lane here. Again, we've got Malatat there with a big uh, star and stripe, and then Clarier right to her outside. And it's just a matter of boom. And so. Yeah, it was a heck of a race. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, let's see here. But that's the thing. Again, I mean, there, you have so many horses in your barn. I, I, you, you mentioned Flightline. You had Happy Saver in there uh, putting, uh, I think it was his fourth consecutive runner-up finish. Um, that, that's a horse. Yeah, he kind of went from yeah. winning his first four to uh, being second in the next one. But, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a really, really quality horse and, yeah. and shows up and runs well every time in multiple distances. And, we were kind of hoping for that speed duel between speaker's corner and flight line and maybe it would set things up and it it looked like for a moment that could that could kind of shape up that way but uh and flight line was was able to put away speaker's corner and you know i thought happy saber ran on well and uh so hopefully uh moves forward in the next one well speaking of speaker's corner uh you're gonna basically uh be thrown down with him but with life is good in the john a Nehrud, uh we, I'm going to show the replay here in the background of uh, Life is Good winning the big ass <laughs> fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Anytime I can get away with saying that, and it's actually not an expletive because it's just <laughs> me. <laughs> it, it's okay. Do it. Exactly, I have to. They're they're a sponsor. We've got the we've got the little mule um, uh, toys. My daughter loves playing with them. Uh, so let's Very see nice. here. Yeah. So here. He is um, winning the dirt mile there at uh, beautiful Del Mar. Um, let's see here. I'm going to make the screen bigger on this side. So tell us about Life is Good and just how good you knew he was from the jump. Well, you know, he, he had already established his form before he came to us in, in California. But uh, so we, we knew about you know, how impressive he was and his reputation, but uh, really he's, he's a horse that to watch Breeze on a weekly basis, he just, uh, he's a phenomenal talent, just such a, such efficient action and, and does things so easily and effortlessly that, you know, sometimes you're, you're watching him Breeze and you're looking at your stopwatch and they, they don't really match up and, <laughs> you know, just how easily he's, he's doing things but uh yeah here in the in the the dirt mile at Del Mar last year I mean it was basically just he was going to throw down his his talent and speed and say come catch me if you can and and obviously that day no one could so yeah it's just it's it's been a lot of fun to, to have him in the barn and to, to watch him train is is you know, he's a joy to watch yeah I, I watched back uh, the Dubai World Cup uh and which was the last start he's had um he obviously won the pegasus world cup over next go uh before that and i thought he was so gallant I, it was just it wasn't just a matter of, of of the distance that day you know i i honestly don't think it was just the distance and and part of the reason i say that is just watching him train and the way he gallops out i i do think a mile and a quarter is within his range what what I was disappointed with in, in Dubai was just the condition of the track that night. It was, it was very, very deep, very, very slow track. I mean, 
those those quality of horses to run the time that they did is just you know in, indicates how how demanding and deep the track was and um so it, it was actually one of the concerns we had we kind of talked about it a couple of months leading into it and we had talked to some of the officials there and we we felt like that you know on the big night as places tend to do they they usually tighten the track down a little bit and and uh, we weren't we weren't looking for any advantages we just wanted a you know a neutral track and i unfortunately don't think we got that we we got a you know a track that was just simply too too slow and too deep and you know it didn't really complement his his style of running well here's an interesting question then for you would you i mean i'm not asking you to commit to anything right now but just as a with with keeneland for example having that shorter stretch and horses that are near or on the lead do quite well in finishing up would you consider doing the classic with him well you know our current plan is is to to run in the nayrud going seven eights we felt like that that was a good place to bring him back after dubai and with with the whitney you know as our our first real goal and so and we talked about should we train up to the whitney just felt like going a mile and an eighth off the layoff come from dubai that the a prep race would 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 suit him better to hopefully set him up for the whitney and then i think the whitney is going to be the race that really defines which way he goes after that okay so it's a possibility sure okay well we love to hear that i mean this could shape up to be one for the ages i flight line life is good i mean so many great horses um let's see i want to make sure i'm not ignoring anybody this is actually my mom saying hello well, that's very nice <laughs> yeah she she she's my biggest fan uh but she she's actually the reason that my family got into horses she started our horse farm up in michigan um nice. where, yeah and okay jay wants to say we know Cornish, who won the TBG Juvenile last year, has not run since. Three for three, moved to your barn. Um, how is he doing? Yeah, he's doing great so far. We've had uh, three breezes with him. He's he's trained very forwardly. Right now, we have him uh, pointed towards the Amsterdam on July 31st at, at Saratoga's his comeback race, and uh, we've been, been real happy with the way he's doing. Well, he certainly uh gave you know I, gave me every indication that he was the horse in the juvenile and uh shout out to my friend leah omira uh whose family runs stonehaven settings who bred him uh wonderful wonderful family and so no that's very exciting uh wayne harrison he wants to know can i ask todd what race is the one he'd like to win most am i right that he's never won the preakness thanks and love from I, the flag blacked out but i think wayne is actually in the uk and if i'm wrong about that wayne i'm sorry yeah i i guess uh you know i'd have to put the preakness on there since uh you know it's it's sort of a catch-22 with the preakness for us because the belmont is is five weeks after the derby and and we've had pretty good success bypassing the preakness and and focusing on the belmont and you know belmont is is home for us this is where we've lived for the past 25 years and or, or more and where our kids grew up and went to went to school and high school so you know to me the the Belmont is 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 a race that we really we really love to, to be a part of so sometimes that uh that means you know the Preakness takes a little bit of a backseat to that but I think when the scenario is right and and the one thing to to focus on the Preakness, it, it's not only the horse, but you have to have a, an owner that's that's understanding and willing to say, you know what, I'll pass the Derby, and uh, you know that that's worked well for Clarevich and, and Chad with with two horses doing that. But uh, you know, some some owners aren't uh, that the Preakness isn't the race that that they covet so much. So you know, sometimes that makes it hard to pass the the Derby, and then of course, if you run in the Derby, the two week turnaround can be tricky. So um, yeah, I, I think at some point when when everything falls in line, we'll we'll try to focus on that. Yeah, I get those crab cakes too. <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, no, they have some great restaurants over there in Baltimore. I will say that for sure. Uh, let's see here. Yes, uh, actually. Todd, will you use Flavin Pratt in Saratoga? Um, before we get to that, we should mention that Flavin will be riding Life is Good 
on Saturday. Because That's correct. For those who don't know, uh, Irad went over for Royal Ascot. He got days. I'm not exactly sure what the infraction was because I don't know exactly their rules as compared to here, but he has days that he's serving right now, right? That's correct. Yeah, he got a five-day suspension and sort of unlike in the U.S. where they'll allow you some flexibility on when you take those days, I think in his case, they were laid out firmly. They were June 29th, June 30th, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And there was no appeal process or, you know, no, no changing of those dates. So, um, unfortunately, that leaves him with, uh, without the opportunity to ride on July 2nd when life is good as running. How hard is it on these guys? I mean, even as successful as he's been and as much money as he, he makes year after year, just having a horse that you have a, that you know is a star and, being, and having to miss riding that star, I'm sure has got to hurt on a, a level beyond all of that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's 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 tough for for him. It's also you know concerning for us. Flavin's a terrific rider, but he's never never ridden life is good. So you always you know like to have someone that's familiar with the horse. But I I, I think his style will, will suit him very well. And and uh, you know he was one of the people that we considered when it looked like for a little while that I read had, had hurt his knee prior to the Pegasus, and there was some concern that he wasn't going to be ready. So. Um, you know, Flavian's won a lot of big races in his career and, and he's done really well for Windstar and he's riding for us a lot since he's, he's been here. So I think it'll, it'll be a good fit. You just mentioned Windstar. I just saw the story come out that they're going to be focusing on training there. Uh, do you have any insight into that? I know Rudolph Brisset is going to be heading things up. Yeah, I, th I, th I don't have a whole lot more insight than probably what you read, but, you know, I think they've made the decision to try to focus you know the the Windstar facility itself, and as as their primary training center, I, Rudolph's going to be a sort of a semi private trainer, and I think they're going to going to try to run a lot of their races from there, and, and part of that focus will will certainly be in Kentucky. But so I think uh, you know they kind of won't be distributing the two year olds in the same fashion that they have been in the past. Okay. We're going to talk two-year-olds in, in just a minute because we have Amanda here saying, I may have missed the early part of the combo, but what about the two-year-olds you're excited about? We're going to get to that very soon. I just want to, before we get to the babies, I want to talk about uh, American Revolution. Uh, I've got a replay here of American Revolution winning the cigar uh, mile, and this was uh, at the end of last year, basically. Came back um, and ran in the blame, and now he's going to be running in the Stephen Foster this weekend, which is a win and you're in. Um, so let me pull up the screen here and this, here we go. Again, this was December 4th of 2021. And cool thing about this horse is, uh, just going back to what we were talking about and, and, and horses that you've trained then going on, not only to be stars on the track, but then stars in the shed. I mean, <laughs> this horse, American Revolution is by constitution, are you trained? And then he's out of a super saver mare. <laughs> I mean, so you got you got, yeah. you got you got you got you got the Todd touch on top and bottom. Right. No, I, I, I love Constitution as a stallion and I think uh, you know, this is an example of a of a horse that broke his maiden going sixth and stretched out and won the, the New York Derby in his second start at the Albany, ran third in the Pennsylvania Derby, and then was able to win the Empire Classic in a grade one at a mile. I mean he's shown his versatility, his toughness seems like that's what we're seeing from a lot of the, the constitutions. And, uh, you know, I, th I think he's, he's, I mean, he's already made a huge impact as a stallion, but I think his, his real big years are, are getting ready to happen because the, the quality of mares that he's been bred to has really, really jumped up. So I, I look for constitution to, to continue to climb the ladder of leading stallions. Yeah, oh, yeah. And so how about this horse coming into the Stephen Foster, um, sticking right there at Churchill Downs? Stephen Foster, as I mentioned, a win in your end, win in your end for the Long Jeans Classic, to be more specific. Um, yeah, just give us insight. So, you know, the, the original plan is he, he is a New York bred, and, and we pointed him for a New York bred stake, the commentator at, at Belmont going a one turn mile, which we we felt like was the you know the ideal spot to start him back and 
unfortunately that race did not fill. So then we sort of were scrambling on, on a backup plan and we ended up landing in the blame, which my biggest concern with that is I just, I really didn't want to run them a mile and an eighth off the, off the layoff. But anyways, we, we needed to get started. And, you know, I think he just, he simply got a little tired the last part off the layoff going a, a mile and an eighth and he had a pretty wide trip that day as well. So, you know, hopefully that, that race and some subsequent good breezes have them set up for, for improved performance, which they'll need. The the Foster certainly looks like it's coming up a very competitive race, but uh, he's yeah, training super. And, <laughs> yeah, it's it's legit. So, um, but we like the way he's doing and hopefully uh, takes some, you know, step forward off his, uh, off his first race back. Oh, and one more, one more uh, older horse, not really old, but a three-year-old anyway, Charge It. So, Charge it after the Derby. You thought he displaced his palate. Yeah, we we're we're confident he did, and I think that's why he didn't run to his capabilities. And uh, so we did a pretty simple myectomy procedure on him, which uh, seems to have done really well. He's been training super, so these the plan is to run him in the Dwyer on Saturday, and and then uh, we'll kind of see how that goes and decide, you know, what where we go from there. But. Uh, we kind of have our eye on the Travers if things were to go well. Nice. Okay, so he can meet up with the stable mate Mo Donegal in there. Yeah, you know, that's a possibility for sure. Yeah, it's got to be hard. I mean, it's exciting to see these horses go against each other, but at the same time, you know, they're all, they're all still coming out of your same barn. And then as for Ness, Alabama? I'm sorry, say it again? Where's a nest is going to run? Oh yeah. Nest. Um, you know, we haven't decided for sure if she's going to have a prep prior to the Alabama. That's certainly our main focus. And we know she'll love the mile and a quarter. So we might, we might just train her up to that. You know, it's not impossible to run her in the coaching club, but I, I love the way she bounced out of the, of the Belmont. She took the race really, really well. Well, she's an extraordinarily beautiful uh, Philly. And uh, so we look forward to seeing what she does next. Now, speaking of Phillies, you know who we got to talk about? <laughs> we got to talk about Money's Gold. My goodness. Okay, before I get to it, I got to give the, the Breeders' Cup shout out because Money's Gold by Munnings. Munnings by Spice Town, Spice Town, 2004 Breeders' Cup Sprint Champion, Eclipse Champion, Sprinter. This filly, not only does she win her debut, she wins her debut by over 14 lengths, and she puts up a 101 buyer, a two year old filly at this point of the year. Insane. I, you couldn't have anticipated that, correct? <laughs> no, no, never. No, I mean, we, we, we knew she, she had natural speed and, you know, we, we will allow our horses to work, but we don't, we don't set them down and ask them for everything they have in the morning. So, you know, we knew she was sharp. She'd been training well. Our two gate works were very good, but no, it, it's impossible to project. You're going to have run one, have one run 56 and change and, and win by 14 and a half links. It just, uh, and then, the, you know, like you said, the figures came back just off the charts. So it was, uh, it was as impressive a debut as you'll see. I mean, even if you look at the, the uh, I was it Jack Christopher, I think in his last race, he put up 107, for example. I mean, this right. is Right, no, I mean, for, for <laughs> two year old Philly, like you said, this time of year to, to do that is uh, super impressive. You know, I think it was Marcus Hirsch. He actually put together a really nice article just about how amazing this was uh, statistically um, about time of year, about, you know, Phillies versus Colts. It, it again, just really um, exciting. So when you were watching this race, I think I read an article that you were watching it from New York. Right. What were you thinking when she's just opening up like, adios, muchachos? Yeah, no, I mean, it was. You're like, holy cow, you know, she's going to win by five. Oh, she's going to win by 10. Oh, no, she went by more than that. So, yeah, and it looked like she was you know, pretty much in, in hand throughout. Exactly. 14 and a half lengths, the official margin there uh, under uh, Hero Rendon. And if I said your name wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, this this uh, w was really a phenomenal performance. Again, Money's gold, buy money is out of Harawa by Medaglia de Oro. Um, she was herself, uh, let's see here. I'm sorry, rather, this is what I find is really interesting because you know I am, again, a, a petty geek here. Um, so she ha she's, got the, she's got the qualifications to be like a great. I mean, this filly hails from the direct female line of the vagrancy and Frisette. So no pressure. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, yeah, but that, yep, but that's the line. And we also have the Breeders' Cup Ped Cred in here. Uh, because, and by the way, she didn't even go off as the favorite. She was the, I mean, it was very close, uh, but she was the second choice, which is crazy now when you look back at it. But yeah, her great granny is a daughter of unbridled and a full sister to a niece who uh, won the 1999 Breeders' Cup Juvenile. So she's got all of that going for her. Was your phone just ringing off the hook after that performance? Yeah, actually, it was. I did get quite a quite a few calls, probably the most for a, for a maiden race than I've had in a while. Has there been any offers already put in for her? Actually, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think most people know that the the, that the lows want to run. Want to low, they, yeah, yeah. They, they want to run, and and uh, so you know, the whole the whole team was excited about her. Gosh, I mean, all the reason to be again. That is money's gold, and she's a Florida bred too. So, so I love that. We got, by the way, everybody, Tampa. We've got our little summer festival going on this weekend. So check that out. Uh, but yeah. Awesome, awesome two-year-old filly. And then you had Major Dude also uh, debut there at Mammoth. Uh, what was the thinking behind taking these horses over there to Jersey? Well, the, you know, the main thing we're focused on is just is getting them started. And some of the some of the maiden races have been a little slow to fill in New York. So I wanted to make sure and, and give them the opportunity to get started, especially with uh, some stakes coming up at Saratoga. This colt has been very straightforward since he came in, very professional. I thought even though, you know, it was going to be hard to hard to duplicate the, the time that the Philly ran and, and his race was clearly slower, but he also overcame some adversity and yeah. showed some game of splitting horses and does something I love to see horses do. When he made the lead, he kind of pricked his ears and let you know there was, there was more in the tank. Yes, he's right there in the, because he's right there in the spendthrift silks. Because we see the bridle, we see the white bridles, but he's in the Spendthrift silks, um, and yeah, and this, kind of in an intimidating spot for yeah. for you know a first time starter, two year old to uh, to be there. And I thought John Velasquez gave him a great ride. He you know he, right here he starts to find a little seam to split horses and kind of encourages him to go up in there and do that. And you know that's uh, that's pretty professional for for a first time starter to to be willing to do that. And I have to say, um, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it to you, but I have definitely mentioned on the show before, my favorite disc staffer of all time is Personal Ensign. And Personal Ensign happens to be this boy's great grandmama. So that's pretty cool to me. You've got, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's impressive stuff. Definitely is. And for those of you who don't know, another fun fact for you regarding Personal Ensign is Personal Ensign. Not only did she win the distaff, but then she had my flag, my flag, multiple grade one winner, but she won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. And then she produced uh, Storm Flag Flying, who also multiple grade one winner who won the uh, Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. So beautiful, beautiful colt here. Again, owns by Spendthrift Farm. Uh, he's by Boltoro, who stands there. And then out of Marita, Mary Rita by Distorted Humor. And that is Major Dude. So what's going to be next for these two two-year-olds in particular? Well, we're we're keeping an eye on the Skylar Bill and the Sanford, and and uh, you know we'll we'll see how they train, and those are possibilities. It felt like we need a little more time. There's, you know, the next round of stakes, the Adirondack and the Saratoga Special. So we'll we'll just kind of play it by ear and see how they're doing and how quickly they want to run back. Awesome. Okay. So also on that same card, uh, going back to talking about an older horse, real quick, Mind Control put in a tremendous performance in the Salvatore Mile. Um, take us through this uh, duel with uh, Hot Rod Charlie. Yeah, I mean, it uh, it was never in doubt. We knew we had it the whole way. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, he, uh, well, I mean, strategically, we felt like that uh, we were, we were the inside speed and, and, uh, yeah, so we wanted to come out running, and if we could establish a lead, that's great. And you know, I'm sure Mike Mike Smith on Hot Rod Charlie, the the big favorite, you know, knew that we were probably the horse to beat, and wasn't gonna wasn't gonna let us walk the dog along the way. So, you know, it was kind of a cat and mouse uh, between Johnny and Mike down the backside, and see, you know, Johnny got him in a you know terrific rhythm. He's cruising along, and then. Michael kind of come up and try to turn up the pressure a couple of times. And then, uh, like we've seen mind control do before, it looks like, uh, you know, he's going to get, uh, get past. He actually does get past similar to what he did in the, in the parks mile last year. And then 
you know, just fight back gamely and it's able to, to get his nose down on the wire. No, I, I, this is, when you see horses throw down like this, and this isn't the first time we've seen in the horse show this type of writ, um, it, it's always impressive because that is something you can't train into them. I'm, no, nah, this is just, uh, <laughs> you know, innate desire to want to wanna win. And that's, uh, he, he's a super cool horse to train. And, and uh, you know, he's just a real classy horse. He's had a, a tremendous career and he just, he loves what he's doing. And, you know, as you can see here, he looks like he's he's beaten. Just says, uh, no, nope, I'm going to come back and give one more big effort. Especially being on that rail. Because when you're sandwiched like that and still to dig in and come out, on top always uh always impressive so we have some questions here and we'll go first with christopher rosales todd who was your go-to jockey for big races i don't know can you name names <laughs> uh, i mean you know my relationship with john velasquez has been a, a long time and uh you know i i think he's uh he's still top top class rider and, and you know in my opinion the, the best to ever do it so we're always very confident we have him on board and, you know, it's a, we're, we're blessed. We have a super colony in, in, in New York right now. And, you know, with, with Irad and, and Flavian coming in and Irad's brother, Jose, and, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a super deep colony and you add veterans like Johnny and, and Joel and Javier to the, you really can go, you can go 10 deep and, and find a rider you're really happy with. Oh, definitely. And, and, like you said, and just the it is cool to see the evolution. I mean, even going back, talking about the horses that are now sires or brood mares, and you still have this relationship with, for example, Johnny. It's it's really tremendous to see that. I don't know if you can answer this one or not because it's like picking one of your children. Who's your favorite horse you've trained in your career? Yeah, I I, re I really can't say that I have you know an all time favorite. I always say that my favorite win was Rags to Riches in the Belmont. That was, that was to me, the most exciting race I was involved with. Um, but, but, you know, it doesn't diminish uh, any of the other ones, but that was our first classic. And, and you know, just the, the drama that unfolded in the entire race with her stumbling at the start yeah. and then getting in a stretch long duel with, with Curlin. It was, it was uh, to me, that was as, as exciting as it gets. Let's see, we have more here. Other than your grade one horses, who was one horse that you were looking forward to run over the upcoming weeks? Um, wow, that's, uh, you know, we have, we have, we're blessed. We have quite a few, um, potentially two or three horses running in the Belmont Derby with the Emanuel and Annapolis and Grand Sonata. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Of course, you know, life is good. We're really excited to get him back and, and, uh, you know, American Revolution and the Foster. So, yeah, it's a dynamic uh, one yeah. too, right? You got him. Dynamic one. We're gonna we're gonna bring him, I think, uh, back to New York, and he'll run in the Suburban on July 9th. Nice. So, um, yeah, we're we're it's at that time of the year when there's there's plenty of action, especially Fourth of July weekend. Oh, Eileen, did I hear you say man? Yeah, when we were talking about the Stephen Foster. So yeah, Mandaloon. Uh, Brad Cox, and he's got American Revolution going up against him, and we'll see how it all goes. Let's see here. Um, I'm just basing these out. Uh, is Mind Control going to go back short, or will he run it? To well, we already went over that one. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm, I get a little bit behind on questions because I'm running everything. <laughs> so we're running the show, running the questions, running the replays here. Uh, let's see here. Like ask Todd if he could compare Liam's map with life is good and their best qualities. Thanks. I, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest similarity is just so, so much talent and, uh, you know, they, they both kind of had similar styles. They kind of run you off your feet a little bit. And, uh, yeah, two, two special horses, obviously both won the Breeders' Cup dirt mile and Liam's map's doing really well as a stallion. So, uh, we're excited to see that. Oh, well, that's for sure. And it's also fun. Liam's map is a half brother to not this time. And to see both styers having success uh, is, is really tremendous. Uh, Michael says, thank you, Todd, for your answer. Nebre is saying good luck in the Alabama with Ness. Hashtag Eclipse Thoroughbred. Jay is also saying thanks, Todd. Answer the questions all you today. With well, thank you. But before I let you go, this is the thing. Like, what time are you going to get up in the morning? <laughs> I'll get up about four. 
That's okay. So I need to ask you then because my, Matt is like an awful sleeper. What is your key to a, a restful night's sleep? Uh, I, I'm a, I'm actually a bad sleeper. You know? Really? I, I can I can go four or five hours and then I start to start to toss and turn and then oh. uh, the the mind starts working and you start training horses at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Great. Well, there you go. Why not? No. So I so we're we're nearing where I because obviously you've got so many horses. Uh, it, it's hard to talk about everybody, but since this is the forecast and we focus on two year olds, you do have a couple of horses that are going to. Um, be debuting in a main special weight at Mammoth. It's going to be um, the second race on the first of July, and so uh, it's for fillies, and they're both tremendously well bred. Let's talk first about uh, Bissett, and right. uh, this, yeah, by Quality Road, who you trained. Um, which, by the way, is also kind of fun because going back to Corniche, Corniche is a son of Quality Road. I should give him a shout out for that as well. Um, so she is owned by Spendthrift. She was bred by Woodford Thoroughbreds um, out of Yes, It's Jackie. Uh, this filly, <laughs> I mean, it, it, again, both of them, because you also have Mirabella for the Lowe's and uh, Into Mischief out of Vaudevillian by Distorted Humor. Mirabella has more bullets on the tab. Is that anything that we should take in consideration when we're looking at stable mates and one's got all these bullets and one doesn't? Or is it just how these horses are in the morning and you're not looking necessarily for them to perform lights out. Well, yeah, I mean, occasionally you might see one that has a significantly different work tab. Both, both of these fillies have trained well. I guess this had took the worst of it drawing the inside. So the, the start's going to be critical for her, but I, 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 I like both of these fillies. They both trained well. And, you know, we're just, uh, we're at that time of the year where we're starting to get, you know, a handful of fillies ready around the same time. And, with some limited maiden races on the East Coast. We just, I, I don't like running two horses against each other when I don't mm -hmm. have to. And of course you don't mind it doing it in, you know, the bigger races like the Belmont, but you know, maiden races, if you have that opportunity to, to spread them out, we always try to, but in this case, we just, we're, we kind of run up against it with a handful of fillies ready to go. And, and you know, if one of these fillies is able to break her maiden, then, you know, a race like the Adirondack would be on the radar. So. Um, I, I think both of them have trained well enough. They'll, they they should be competitive first time out. Well, both of them have amazing pedigrees. So if they do turn out to have talent on the track, I mean, watch out. Bissett herself was a $525,000 Keeneland September yearling. That mother that I mentioned, yes, it's Jackie, a half-sister to another scion of Quality Road, that being champion Abel Tasman. So that's pretty uh, impressive right there. She's going to have Paco Lopez up. So I would assume he's going to, knowing Paco, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to have her nice and sharp out of the gate. Uh, and then as for uh, Mirabella, uh, another horse with a, a tremendous pedigree by Into Mischief. And then her mom is a half sister to Life at Penn. Yeah. Nice that's fair. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, and so uh, does it make it any more special or no? In, in this case, when you're waiting or anticipating to see what they're going to do first time. Oh, yeah. No, to me, two-year-old two racing is, is the most exciting. And, and uh, you know, so that's why we're trying to figure out in the mornings is who's who's ready to go, who's not ready to go, what they're ready to do, how far they want to run, what surface they want to run on. So. You know, that to, to me, it's, a, it's the most exciting time of the year to, to be getting uh, the two-year-olds ready to go. Yeah, and not only that, but especially, again, if, if these horses can win or, you know, go forward and, and realize what you see on the page, because even going beyond uh, Life is 10 being in the mixer, I mean, that's the family of Tappet and Glitterman and just all of it. it it's just, to me, it reads like uh, when you're going through the annals of history and you're just hoping that these horses become heir apparent to what they have there. Um, is there anybody else that we should keep our eyes out for as we are heading into Saratoga in particular? Is there a, a horse that you can mention that just has you going, oh, just wait until this one is unveiled? You have no idea. Oh, I don't, I don't know if we've seen that one yet. We, we, we're kind of at the stage where we have one group that's ready and then another group that's kind of that three or four weeks behind and you know some of the horses that are more classically bred we haven't really cranked up yet the curlins and those sorts but the the, the one horse i was really pleased with his debut is forte 
son of violence that, that won his oh. debut at Belmont impressively. And he's pointing for the Sanford. And I, I really like the way he's been training since his, since his maiden win. What, uh, what is, when you're looking at now, taking these horses from that first win and now going up against winners, uh, what are you looking for with them? I, I, exactly. I mean, so many people just want to see a horse keep winning. But are you looking for something in particular where, again, it doesn't matter if, if they stay undefeated in that next start. You're just looking for some sort of progression in particular, whether it's on the mental side or, or just showing a different dimension and style. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of times after a debut, you'll 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 sort of get some insight into how horse is going to react to that first race. Some of them are going to physically and mentally handle it really well and improve, and some of them it's going to kind of stir them up and knock them off their feet and and be hard on them. And and so in this Colts case, he what I like about his debut is that Forte, unlike again, right? Forte, yeah, is that he he didn't just go straight to the front and blitz the field. He, he kind of sat behind some horses. He took a little dirt in his face. He angled out and ran by them and, and seemed to have something left in, in the tank and came back with two two really solid half-mile breezes and then a good five for a long breeze and continued to gallop out like more distance is going gonna, is gonna to suit him well. So, you know, those, those are the kind of things you're looking for when, uh, you know, after they make a, their first start. Um, before we let you go, I just want to make sure I don't have any questions outstanding. And I do want to ask you another one myself, which maybe I'll ask you that first and then I'll go back to these questions. Uh, outside of your own horses, who is who for you is the most exciting horse in training? Oh, I, I think you'd have to say flight line. You know, I mean, he was he was mega impressive in the Met Mile. And, um, you know, all of his starts have, have been, you know, just just uh, blow the field away type. So, uh uh, I'll I'll be interested. I, it doesn't sound like uh, he's coming back for the Whitney. I, I think I read that he's going Pacific Classic, Classic route. Classic. So, yeah, I was I was kind of thinking, you know, it's going to be interesting when him and Life is Ten, if 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 uh, Life is Good, if if they meet. Uh, life is Ten. That's a good name. Yeah, <laughs> might have to save that one. Life is um, a ten. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, if, if those two meet, I think I think that could be. Uh, very very interesting right especially again i think especially if they both and this is just me wanting this to happen i would love to see them throw down the mile quarter at keeneland yeah I, it could I happen mean, we'll on. see <laughs> i love that i love the game myth. by the way imagine i was talking to terry finley about flight line i didn't know he even had a scar on his butt until i think it was jeff lifson posted a photo of him from the paddock there and I was like, dang, how did that happen? So I had Terry on the show two weeks ago and I asked him and he told me the story that this happened. Uh, he got caught on a stall at some point during the, the, the foundation training. And he doesn't know, they don't know exactly what got in there, but anyway, he tore it up. And so they, they had a stitch back together. He gave a ton of love to the veterinary team who, who was able to put it all back in place. But I can't imagine just the nerves. I mean, this was a one million dollar yearling. What would you do if you got that phone call? Oh, I've had those phone calls. So oh, okay. um, yeah, no, it uh, yeah, it, it is an impressive scar. I, I hadn't seen it in person until the Met Mile. It's 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 impressive. But uh, that, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that was uh, you know that's one of those uh, trainers' nightmare situations when when something like that happens, and you know it's just it's part of the deal you know things uh things can happen at, at any time so you, you try yeah. to take every precaution you can and then sometimes you know crazy things can can happen well i i, I even kind of joked with terry i said i don't know maybe however everything went back together the sinew and the muscle and everything maybe it, it's made him even stronger even more freakier than he would maybe. have been otherwise that's a, that's the that i'm I'm, a, I'm an internal optimist i'm that person who I'm looking for the bright side in everything so now we're going to wrap things up with the actual viewers because we have a ton of viewers watching right now, Todd. Uh, so thank you for that. You, you, bring, you bring in the star power. I love it. So, okay. Robin, writing in from Trinidad, question for Todd. What are some of the strengths you try to copy from Dwayne Lucas to incorporate in your training to this day? Well, like I said earlier, I think, I think Wayne's the greatest and, uh, you know, he, the, th the thing that he always emphasized was the attention to detail and every, every detail matters. And, and, 
you know, he's just a tremendous caretaker and, and, uh, you know, just wanted, wanted every, every base covered. And, and so that's, that's what you try to do. And, and I think uh, most successful people try to try to follow that. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I, I'm just in awe that he's still, he's got that touch. I mean, that horse whisper, you talk about a horse whisper. He's got that touch. He's just got that je ne sais quoi that you either have or you don't have it. And it's just incredible to see not only the success he has had, but the people like you, you know, all these other different trainers have been interconnected through that barn um, and having the success they've had. And it's, it's remained like a family from what I gather when I talk to you guys, you all seem to have your stories of working with each other. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. And it's, it's, it's really fun when we were able to occasionally get together and have sort of a, semi-family reunion we we have a lot of laughs i love that so much um you do have people thanking you for answering questions wayne said good luck for the breeders cup uh good luck here we have todd how can we get in touch with you if someone has a runner for you to they want you to look at to train you have a website no and and uh yeah, i think our get... website's a good way to to contact us and uh yeah i mean we're we're always open to looking at a good horse do you think some people are intimidated to get in touch with you when they know that you have so many big horses uh and and you still have that welcome mat out for people to if they've got a a, a horse that they think's got ability to ask you you know if you'd be willing to take a look yeah we, we find that every once in a while someone will contact us and they'll you know they'll we'll talk to them about the horse and maybe get a little background on them and, and, you know, agree to take them in and they'll, they'll say, Oh, we're surprised, you know, that, that you'd have room. But like I said, you never, you never know where a good, good horse might come from. So we're, we're open-minded. That is for sure. Let's see here. So great to hear Todd talk about his horses past and present. So interesting. Will be great following Forte. Thank you both Stuart over in the UK. Thank you, Stuart. I love it. We have an we're international. I know. Right. But that's okay. And I, uh let's see here we've got brandon saying thank you for answering my question wish you all the best this season and see you at the spot we're actually matt and i we're going on vacation finally we haven't taken a vacation in forever uh and so we're gonna go for whitney weekend nice yeah well it's a big weekend yes <laughs> you're gonna be a little sure. bit busy we're going to be a little bit busy. uh kelly thanks for sharing this interview todd is fantastic Jay again, Todd, I got to meet you and your dad and two sons. Are any of your sons getting involved in racing? So one of my sons, Kyle, just graduated from Texas A&M in uh, mechanical engineering, just took a wow. job in Houston. Wow. And uh, so he will not. My other son is going to start veterinary school in, uh, at the end of July. So I think there's a good chance he'll end up in the industry, hopefully, as a veterinarian. That's awesome. Lazy Dog says, woof, woof, from North California. <laughs> woof, woof, back, my friend. Uh, Mayberry says, like, elite runners. Yeah, okay, so that's, I guess, who, that's their staple name. So, again, if you go and you go to, I mean, Todd Clutcher Racing has a presence on Twitter, presence on a website as well. So, if you go Google them, uh, you can find out how to get in contact. Um, don't be fooled, because not the Toddster is truly not the Toddster on Twitter. Do we know <laughs> who that is? I have some suspicions, but no. I have some suspicions, too. Okay, let's see here. Oh, and, and Jagan, I know your dad breaks the two-year-olds in Ocala. Yeah, yeah, right? Yes, he does. Oh, gosh, that's awesome. It's a family affair. Tom, my wife left, loves betting on you and yours. Well, oh. thank you, Lazy Dog. And I, Lazy Dog must have a restaurant. And if they have a restaurant, I think now that you should get free Lazy Dog grub if you're ever in Northern California. Good plan. Are you a healthy eater or are you, are you ready to like go? What, what's that guy's name who eats all the hot dogs? No, no, I, that, I don't even like watching that, but no, I'm not. I get sick too. I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, what are you doing? But anyway, um, yeah, so that is basically, oh wait, no, I got one more. The best pleasure horse I've ever seen was Awesome Maria. Yeah, she was a great one. I, do you lose track of your horses ever? Just like, oh yeah, I trained that one too. No, I mean it's it's always fun to reminisce about some of the good ones in the past. 
No, well, you pass and there's so much more to be uh, looking forward to in the future. Todd, I got to thank you so much for your time, especially knowing that you're going to be getting up at four in the morning. Um, but we, we wish you all the best going forward and everybody else, uh, just a, a heads up again, we do have Win in Your In Action coming up this weekend. Uh, let's see here if I got the challenge series page. I can pull up here real quick. Uh, the Princess Rooney is a win in your in for the Longines distaff. It's actually, do you remember, I mean, obviously you, was, you would have been much younger, but do you remember uh, Princess Rooney watching her run? She's our first oh, distaff yeah. winner, 84. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I were your? If, uh, I think if I remember right, did Eddie Delahousie drop his whip that day? I think you're right. Yeah, but I think he, you're he, right. he never was going to hit her anyways. But uh, no. Yeah, and I remember that. And yeah, it, it, it's uh, it, again everybody. If you, it's really fun. I mean, you and I, we just you live and breathe a sport. Period. And you know, me just being a a fan who's kind of. I mean, I've been involved, but more on the periphery, much so than you. you again, you're in it. Um, but it, some people don't know the stories behind the names of these races. So it's always fun to, to go back and look. So again, everybody, Princess Rooney named for the inaugural uh, victress of the distaff back in 1984. And then also again, the Stephen Foster stakes when you're in for the long jeans classic. Um, so again, we're gonna be looking at Gulfstream Park for the Princess Rooney. We're gonna be looking at Churchill Downs for the Stephen Foster. And to wrap things up, Eileen, thank you guys. Great interview, Red. He makes the interview. So Todd, again, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Sorry for being late. Oh gosh, no. I mean, you, you had you had good reason. So everybody, again, this has been your Future Stars forecast on a two-year-old Tuesday. I'll catch you back here next week. Thank you so much again to my very, very, very special guest, Hall of Famer, Todd Pleasure. Thanks, Ron. Thank you.